Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, the pitch clock, pitch timer, whatever you want to call it, uh, caused some mayhem in the baseball world. So we'll get into that and what we think about it. There was some spring training games this weekend on the Dodgers side. Who pitched, who played, who looked good, who didn't. We'll get into that as well. And we'll talk about Mookie Betts maybe not being leadoff man this year. That's what's on tap, so make sure to keep it Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers. Your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Yo, 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 Dodger fans. Welcome to Locked On Dodgers. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, the number one local sports daily podcast network. Locked On, your team every day. This is the daily podcast covering the Los Angeles Dodgers, bringing you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue. You can find us wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked on Dodgers. And if you don't want to miss a day because, you know, we're not going to make sure to subscribe in each of those places and get it sent directly to you. This is your first time listener watching. I'm Vince Samperio, and I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Snyder. And together we are Locked on Dodgers. Both of us uh, currently cover the team, have spent years covering the team, press box, locker room. We're not quite insiders, but as we say, we're here to bring you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue. And that's what we try to do every weekday morning for you for about 30 minutes. Not always together, but today we are together. So that means it's an extra better episode. Absolutely. And uh, I think what everybody wants to know, Vince, was how was your birthday? Birthday was good. Uh, you know, coldest, one of the coldest storms in L.A. Uh, in a while, but we made do. And uh, yeah, it was good. It was uh so I've been on a workout challenge the last six weeks and it ended on Saturday. So we got to enjoy real food for the first time in a long time. So that helped and had beer for the first time in a long time. So that also helped. Well, congratulations on yeah. that. Did you listen to my episode on Friday where I gave Vince, Vince Samperio birthday stats? I did. I like that. I like that. Did you know that you were right between Zach Lee and Chris Taylor in birthdays? I did not know that. Yeah. I knew I was older than Chris Taylor, but I didn't know that I was in between them. Yeah, or I think you're younger than Chris Taylor and older than Zach Lee. Yeah. But somewhere right in between. I don't remember which ones. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, and and I did do the math and figure out that you are slightly closer in age to my daughter, daughter than to me. So uh, still just a kid, no matter how old you feel. <laughs> yes, I'm, exactly. I actually feel younger than I did in the past in terms of like, all right, I'm cool at 32, but I still try to be in bed by like 410 every night. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, but either way, we are here to talk about the Dodgers and the biggest story, not just in the Dodgers, but in the baseball world this weekend was the new rules, uh, mainly the pitch clock, which I have on good authority that MLB, at least in their sense, will be referring to it as a pitch timer uh, because they don't want they still want the, you know, baseball doesn't run on clocks type of feel to it. So that's why they don't choose pitch clock. Uh, but I would imagine we're going to use pitch clock most of this year. So, But either way, uh, it didn't really affect too much of the Dodger games this weekend. There was a couple infractions, but there was a couple bigger issues. Not issues, I guess, things that happened in other games. A game ended uh, in a tie, but it, the game ended on a pitch infraction. Manny Machado was the first one to get the, the batter infraction and get an automatic strike. Uh, but yeah, Jeff, I know you've been online all weekend as a fan and proponent of it. And honestly, I'm in the same boat, but I'll let you speak to it first and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk after. Yeah, I, I think it's funny, uh, but not ha ha funny, how th- this is the latest example of people coming out and saying, if you disagree with me on this point, you're not a true baseball fan. And uh, I've seen a lot of that on the people who are opposed to the pitch clock and uh I haven't seen it as much from the people who are in favor of the pitch clock and I am in favor of the pitch clock. I I understand why some people don't. I I believe that most of the people who are opposed to it are eventually going to at least get used to it and maybe even really like it. Um, But yeah, for me, it, it, it keeps the game moving along and I love it and it's not less baseball. And that's the thing. Why would you want less baseball? I don't, I want less of the stuff that's not baseball, you know? And and what does I, I saw somebody saying, well, if Vince Scully was still, still calling games, he wouldn't even have a chance to get his stories told because it's moving so quickly. Vince Scully, 
Vince Scully was named the most influential sports personality in Los Angeles history the year before I was born. Uh, and back then, the average time of games was like two hours and 15 minutes. The vast majority of Vince Scully's broadcasting career came when games moved as quickly as they're moving now. It's just the fact that people aren't used to it that they don't like. But uh, for me, I love it. I love pitcher gets the ball back and he's ready to throw the next pitch. The batter is getting in the box because it's 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 baseball. It's like all the amount of baseball concentrated. You know, we, before we were getting two hours worth of baseball stuffed into three hours and 15 minutes. Now we're getting two hours worth of baseball in two and a half hours, you know, and, and the only non-baseball is just your commercials. I love it. And I love it. I was surprised. I knew I was going to love it. I was surprised at how much I loved it watching games this weekend. And even the game, that Red Sox Braves game that ended on an infraction. I love that that happened because guess what? Now players are going to know, I guess I ought to stop dinking around and get ready to hit when, when the game's on the line and I've got two strikes. Like, you know, that's why you have spring training with these rules. One of my issues when MLB cracked down on the sticky stuff in 2021 was that they did it mid season instead of in spring training, because this is why you have spring training. So people can get used to new rules. By the time the games start mattering, players aren't going to get called for infractions hardly ever. And when they do, yeah, it'll be, Oh, that's weird. But, if you've watched minor league games, I, I've been to minor league games. I don't know that I've ever seen an infraction called in a minor league game because with the clock, you get used to it and you start, it, it just becomes your new tempo. It'll take time. It may even be early this regular season. Maybe there are still, still be some guys getting used to it. Not very many though. And maybe not any because it's easy enough. And yeah, it, it makes sense that MLB wants to call it a pitch timer because that's a very MLB solution because it has stupid reasoning and is less precise and less accurate. So it makes sense that Rob Manfred would want that because uh, it's a stupid idea. It doesn't time the pitches. It times the time between pitches. So call it the between pitches timer at least, or just call it the pitch clock because the clock that says how long you have to pitch. Uh, but I loved it and I, I think it's great. Well, technically it's more of a timer than a clock anyways. Well, it's if you go, a timer, on your, if you go to iPhone pitches. and you go to timer, it's, a countdown from whatever time you want. Yeah, but it's not timing pitch. A pitch timer would be timing your pitches. It's a, I know, but, well, it, but your timing. It's a dead time timer. Yeah. So, but um, yeah. But it's either a, way, the uproar, o- the uproar over it was just so overblown this weekend because one, you're not going to notice it after the first month of the season. Like we're we're not going to notice it. There might be a handful of infractions a week in MLB games where we're going to notice it again after like the first month of the season is in playoffs because, you know, the game is a little bit different in playoffs. There's, you know, more stress and everything else. And, you know, guys will be used to it, but it'll also be, you know, guys, the game slow does slow down in playoffs. So it's, as weird as it sounds in baseball, but the game does, there's a reason there's four hour games in the playoffs rather than, you know, the three hour games that are in regular season for the most part. But yeah, I mean, the uproar is, you're not going to notice it after the first month. You might not even notice it after a few weeks here in spring training. The only time it's going to come up is the rare occasions where someone forgets or messes up. Um, and I think what we would, I think what we, what we might see more so than infractions is pitchers making more mistakes and like trying to hurry up. And then they, you know, whatever, they leave a fastball over the middle or they break, hang a breaking ball. That might be more what we see than actual infractions. Yeah, it's not less baseball in terms of the game played. Now, I can understand it from, like, two perspectives on my end. When I'm going to a game at Dodger Stadium, I don't mind when the game runs three hours because I'm at Dodger Stadium. Like, I don't really care. As someone who also works in baseball and sometimes has to watch games for the living, yeah, I don't mind games going two and a half hours instead of three hours because – I get 30 minutes back of my life or, you know, whatever the case is, if I, if Dodger games end at nine 30 and I'm at the game and I'm home by 10, that's a lot better than games ending at 10 and I'm home by 10 30, 11, whatever the case is. So yeah, and I feel as like a dad, you know, yeah. as a dad for me, it's like kids might actually get to get to stay up and watch the end of a baseball game once in a while, which might be kind of important to building the next generation of baseball fans. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, it, it, there's going to be uproar. <laughs> it was just so funny. Like the, things people bring up but 
uh, just this is very well. We'll see. It's going to be very similar to when they started checking pictures for sticky stuff, and that first weekend was uproar and everything else, and you know, a couple funny moments, and then we don't even notice it anymore. Yep, but, and it's uh, I noticed that a lot of pitchers are actually throwing their pitch with seven seconds left on the timer. You know, it's just because once you get in the mindset of oh, I have the ball, the next thing I need, need to do is pitch instead of adjusting my cup and spitting and, and all that stuff. It's like, oh, I have the ball. I might as well throw it now. And so I, I think you're not even going to see many infractions because guys are just going to be – you'll get used to the pace and it'll be a, oh, it's time to play baseball. Let's play baseball. Yeah, the one that Chris ta Chris Taylor got an infraction and he mentioned – that one was on the 30 seconds that you have from in between batters. And he said, you know, you get caught watching the play and or whatever's going on ahead of you. And then he wasn't quite ready when you know he was able to step in. But like I said, that's something. All the infractions are going to happen these first couple weeks. And then, like I said, in regular season, maybe the first month or so. And then after that, we're not even going to notice it anymore. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, talking about Mookie Betts next and where he's going to bat in the lineup. But first, let's talk about Built Bar because today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, then you got to try a Built Bar. We're getting into baseball season, which means, you know, you might be consuming more things that you did during off season, depending if you're going to games or if you like to go watch games at bars or restaurants or whatever the case is. But Bill Bars can help you out on those other times throughout the day when you need something good. They're got full of protein, full of fiber, low calorie, low carb, low sugar. They're covered in 100 percent real chocolate. They taste great and they got a bunch of great flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie. Coconut almond, cookies and cream, double chocolate, coconut puff, bunch of new flavors that come out throughout the year. And best part, you don't have to wait and order them online at built.com anymore, although you still can do that. You can go to your local Walmart or Sam's Club, head to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of built bars, a four bar box, a 13 bar box. Get yourself some built bars and get your life a little bit healthier in the sense. So uh, go grab a box today and you can thank us after. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. Check out Locked On Fantasy Baseball for your second listen. Win your league by listening to Mountain Dom every day as they bring you the best fantasy draft strategies wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube. All right, Jeff. So Mookie Betts hasn't played yet in the spring the first two games. He should be playing today on Monday. But there was some talk about Mookie Betts over the over the weekend. Uh Mookie is supposed to hit in the two or three hole for Team USA in the World Baseball Classic. Supposedly, Dave Roberts was asked about considering dropping Mookie down the lineup for better RBI opportunity with the Dodgers. He said, quote, I'm thinking about it. I think that having that discussion is thoughtful. It makes sense given the fact that you don't expect him to steal bases like he's done in the past. He showed some more power, which potentially could have been more production as far as runs batted in. But if you're talking about moving Mookie, you've also got to have a better option. And then Mookie in the past has, you know, said that he likes hitting leadoff. Uh, we know that when he did not hit leadoff, the one here he did struggle. We can't say that it's for sure when because he, he wasn't in the leadoff hole, but whatever the case, that's where we're at. And I think the biggest takeaway from this is exactly the last part of what Dave said is you only take Mookie out of the leadoff spot if you have someone better in the leadoff spot. And it's not necessarily a guarantee at the moment that the Dodgers would be able to have that. Yeah, and, and Roberts did say that Mookie is open to the change, uh, more open than he's been in the past, uh, and, and maybe that's why they're even thinking about it. Uh, but the fact, it's hard to picture them taking Mookie out of the leadoff spot now when they didn't do it last year when they had Trey Turner, an actual prototypical leadoff man. Um, but, yeah, you do have to have a better option, and Roberts that same day said that he likes Gavin Lux at the bottom of the order and plans on keeping him there. And Gavin Lux is really the only realistic option to replace Mookie at leadoff. You know, Gavin Lux before the neck injury had a 373 on base percentage last year, which is great for a leadoff man. He's the fastest guy on the team or one of the fastest guys on the team, which is obviously nice. Uh, doesn't hit a ton of home runs. And so you're not wasting his power. Does get some extra base hits to get himself in a scoring position for, for Freeman and Betts. You know, Lux would make sense in a lot of ways. But I also really agree with the decision to keep him lower in the order. I really like Gavin Lux in the nine hole, even as you know, when, when you're in Little League, the coach tells the kid who's batting ninth, Oh, yeah, you're our second leadoff man. But that coach is lying. That, that kid's batting ninth because he sucks. But Lux actually does serve as kind of a second leadoff man, you know, where the second time through the order, Lux is getting on base for Mookie Betts. And, you know, last year, 
Mookie drove in Lux uh, 11 times. Trey drove in Lux nine times. Uh, Freddie drove in Lux 17 times. You know, he, he was on base for those guys a lot. And uh, I like him in that role. The only other guy who I see as a potential leadoff man and definitely not the beginning of the season would be Miguel Vargas. You know, because Vargas is fast. He's a great hitter. He's he's probably going to have a good on-base presence. He, ha- he has good command of the of the strike zone. He, his on-base percentage in AAA last year was over 400. Um, his slash line was his on-base and slugging were almost identical to Freddie Freeman's last year. Uh, obviously, you that's on base without swinging the bat. Yeah, uh, and, and so you can uh, you can do that, but they're not going to throw Miguel Vargas in as the leadoff hitter to start his career. But I could see two months into the season if Vargas is hitting really well and Mookie's hitting a lot of home runs. I could see them kind of floating that idea to see, hey, Mookie, let's get you more RBI chances. Let's drop you down to the three hole and put Vargas at the top of the order. That wouldn't shock me at all, but I don't think there's anybody else to bat lead off to start the season. Yeah, definitely not. And, you know, Lex is that guy. He did hit lead off in the first game of, of spring. And, you know, it, it's possible that he can find it there. I just don't think they move, especially, you know, if you didn't sign JD Martinez, then. I think you really have to consider putting Mookie down just because they don't necessarily, you know, they didn't necessarily have run producers or run, you know, guys that can bring runs in or uh, have some slug. But now that you have JD Martinez, you know, Mookie, Freddie, JD, Will Smith, Max Muncie, top five is one of the best, you know, still one of the best five top fives in baseball. So we'll see what happens. Uh, You know, Lex would be ideal if he can fill that role just to move everyone down the spot, but it, would remain to be seen. And then if you start the season with Mookie and lead off, you know, do you really want to change that up? If he's, if everything's going well at some point in the season, who knows? But yeah, I mean, it's fun to talk about at least. And with Mookie, you know, hitting the 35 home runs last year, that's automatic conversation starter of, okay, should we move him down a little bit, you know, and getting some of these lead off lead off home runs or home runs with nobody on base uh, as, as guys with run or home runs with runners on base. But either way, the home, if the home runs come, they're going to bring in runs regardless. So, yeah, they've had Muncie bat lead off in the past at times, uh, but Muncie would be a weird choice. If you're moving Mookie because he hits too many home runs, you're not going to move down like the guy who's most likely on the team to have more homers than Mookie this year. Um, but yeah, and uh, one good thing is because Mookie will be playing in the WBC, Robert said he'll have plenty of opportunities this spring to try different guys in the leadoff spot. But Roberts, his his final comments on Mookie were, it's hard to come off Mookie not being the best option. And while that's yeah. not grammatically correct, the spirit of the message is absolutely right. You know, you can think about all these things, but then when you're done thinking about it, you're like, yeah, Mookie's our leadoff guy, and he should be. The only Last year, I, it was a conversation between Mookie and Trey and Freddie. They're the ones who kind of worked together to come up with that, to, okay, what order should we bat at the top of the lineup? So I, I could see it being Mookie's idea, Lay, you know, part way in the season if Vargas is hitting really well or or Lux or whatever it is, and Mookie's hitting a ton of homers. I could see Mookie saying, "Hey, let's talk about this." And, and you know, if it was Mookie's idea and he went to Roberts with it, I, I think everybody would be more comfortable with it, knowing that. And, and even just subconsciously for bets, uh, I think he would be more successful if it was a role that he chose. And not like in a way of catering to him, just a natural human psychology. Hey, I chose to do this. It's why you clean your room better when you chose to clean your room than when your mom tells you to clean your room. You know, this was my idea and I'm going to go do, be awesome at it. I So I could see that happening possibly at some point during the season. Yeah. Um, that and we talked about Mookie playing second, or you talked about Mookie playing second base a little bit last year, but just, you know, the general conversation, they said he might play it a little bit in the WBC. So shout out to the world baseball classic, uh, throwing some Mookie ideas, playing second base and lower in the lineup. Uh, so the Dodgers can see what it looks like if he does happen. Yeah. Mark DeRosa is just the, uh, the testing, the, the, the Andrew lab Friedman's for puppetry. Yeah. Yep. Andrew Friedman's puppetry the way that, extended. The, yeah. The way the MLB uses the, the whatever independent league that is the Atlantic league or whatever. That's what the WBSC is for Andrew Freeman and Dave Roberts. Yeah, so uh, that's it for the Mookie conversation. Now let's talk about the weekend and kind of what we saw. Obviously, no 
knee jerk reactions. But real quick, thank you for making Lockdown Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you find podcasts and subscribe, and uh, we'll get sent directly to whatever phone or device you have. All right, Jeff, uh, real quick before we get into the Dodger side of things from the weekend, there was some news in the NL West. Manny Machado re-upped with the Padres. He, The five years he had left is now 10 years and $350 million, which puts the total contract with the Padres after it's all said and done, 15 years, 470 mil. Manny Machado said that he was going to opt out. He gave a soft date, and it, they didn't work it out. That's when they said he was going to opt out, and then they got a deal done uh, about 10 days after that soft date that he had given. So doesn't affect the Dodgers. I know that the Dodgers kind of got linked to him more so in, like, people writing columns rather than actual links to the team. Uh, but either way, it just takes one big free agent out of the pot for next offseason, which hurts the Dodgers in the sense of, more teams available for like Otani or somebody else uh, with, you know, that's going to be a free agent. Yeah. It was already going to be a very weak free agent class, even if Machado was in it. Uh, now it's basically Otani and the other guys. Uh, obviously Julio will be one of the best pitchers on the market. Clayton Kershaw will technically be a free agent, uh, but not a traditional free agent, but yeah, there, there's not a ton. It's definitely, definitely not going to be the loaded market that it was this off season. Yeah. Now I wonder if, the contract Machado put up for a bet with that one fan. I wonder if this extension gets part of that and now he has to give him even more money. Oh man. Yeah. That dude, uh, man, he's just digging that hole deeper and deeper. Yeah. Uh, but either way, there was Dodger baseball this weekend and I don't know. The Dodgers lost the game on Saturday, won a game on Sunday. Uh, most of the main players other than Mookie, I think all the position play or, Jason Hayward didn't play either, but for the most part, most position players played. Uh, none of the ones I were really looking at. James Outman played, but no one else that's really like on the bubble. Miguel Vargas played defense only and drew a walk, even though the other team knew he wasn't going to swing the bat. And then we saw a lot of guys on the mound. So, yeah, I don't know where you want to start with this. We can just kind of throw out things we noticed, things we saw, or if there was anything we're going to be looking for the rest of the week. Yeah, we definitely don't look at results of the of the games, but uh, Freddie Freeman's swing looked really, really nice. He took that slider. It wasn't a bad pitch. It wasn't. I don't think. I think the pitcher expect was worth looking for a back foot slider, and instead he got one on the the low and inside corner of late. Uh, and, but Freddie's swing looked beautiful. And uh, one thing that I'm looking for this year is more home runs from Freddie Freeman. And so. That got me a little bit excited, obviously, with the all the caveats of it's his first spring training at bat, blah, 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 blah. But it was it was a beautiful swing and one that I'm hoping to see a lot more of this year. Uh, and, and then Hunter Fiducia on Sunday. Like, it, it was kind of funny. So I, I missed the first couple of innings of the game. I was at church, got home, turned on the game. My parents were up visiting me this, this weekend, and Hunter Fiducia was up at the plate. And uh, my dad said, who's that guy? And so I was telling him about Hunter Fiducia. You know, Hunter actually might be on our podcast at some point. Uh, uh, he's a guy I've talked with his agent in the past about having him on the show. And uh, and I was telling him, yeah, he's probably one of those guys who is a, a minor league catcher who will sometimes get, you know, called up. He'll, he'll occasionally end up on a 40-man roster, occasionally spend three weeks or a month in the majors when somebody's hurt, you know, and just kind of make a living over the years as a minor league catcher who sometimes makes it to the big leagues. Uh, and then Fiducia hits a sack fly to the warning track and that on the next pitch. And then his next time up, he hits an opposite field home run. Then his next time after that, he hits a two run double. Well, maybe I, uh, maybe he heard me uh, downplaying his potential as a player. Cause uh, he looked good. I mean, it's spring training. I'm, I'm not actually suggesting, you know, especially with the Dodgers glut of catchers, you know, if Hunter Fiducia makes it as a, as a star in the big leagues, it probably won't even be with the Dodgers, but uh, it was fun to see guys like that. They had several minor leaguers on Sunday getting some hits. And uh, that's one of the fun things about spring training is seeing these guys who we might see in the future. Yeah. And Saturday's game was at least on the mound, really only a couple guys or one guy that has a chance and one guy that probably doesn't. Michael Grove threw an inning. He gave up a home run to Rowdy Telez. 
Justin Brule threw an inning, gave up two runs, including a home run to a left-handed hitter. And then Jordan Yamamoto, the only other real name from there, uh, he also gave up two runs. So not not a great start for those guys in their spring. Then we saw Ruby De La Rosa come in and pitch uh, basically a long time after the last time we saw him pitch with the Dodgers. He threw a, a clean inning on Saturday. Sunday we saw a little bit more of the guys that we expect to see this season. One of those guys being Shelby Miller, who didn't make it out of his inning. He didn't pitch horribly, but like I said, he didn't get it out of the inning. Uh, he ended up you know, giving up, I think, a couple runs uh, against the Cubs. But, you know, we saw Alex Vesia. We saw Bruce Dark Gratterall. We saw Adam Kalarik, who has an outside chance of making the roster. He threw a scoreless inning. Yeah, but other than that, it, it was a lot of guys that we don't expect to see with the Dodgers throwing this weekend. And then Shelby Miller. Again, he gave up three hits. He gave up three runs. He did have a strikeout. I don't expect that to really mean anything as we continue to go on. At least I would hope not. Yeah, and and, and that really does come down. Even Shelby Miller, yeah, he struggled, but it's not really something to be concerned about because it's his first spring training outing. And, you know, if he's still – if he never has a good outing this spring, I'll start to get a little concerned. But I always go back my back in 2013, uh, first time I went to spring training, I was there with my son. Clayton Kershaw had a terrible spring, just got lit up. We watched him get lit up in Peoria against the Padres. And, and then Kershaw had the best season of his career up to that point. And it just, you know, spring training really doesn't mean a ton. You're working on things. And, and that's the thing that we as fans don't really, we're not privy to. We don't know what Shelby Miller was working on. You know, maybe he was working on something specific and that's why he got hit. Maybe he wasn't, but, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, I'm not going to get too, it's kind of like a game at Coors Field. You don't get too high or low about the, uh, the results. Cause it's not real baseball, uh, spring training and Coors Field field have that in common, not real baseball. Uh, but it's, you know, for me, it's just fun to have baseball back and, uh, Mark Washington looked good. I've heard his name a little bit as a kind of a, a not a top prospect for the Dodgers because he's a reliever. Relievers don't make top prospect lists, but uh, he's a big dude, throws hard, and looked pretty good. And, uh, you know, guys like that, it's always fun just to see and, and kind of think about, oh, I wonder if he's going to be something in the future. Yeah, another thing to note about Miller is not only is it his first outing of the spring, but first outing of the spring as a Dodger, there might be things that they asked him to try or work on this offseason season. You know, that they, there's a reason they signed him, and it's not just because of what he did last year because, you know, if it was based on that, there would have been more teams in looking for him. It's because they saw something or they want him to work on something or, you know, whatever the case is. So that just that taking that with the grain of salt, like, you know, not just with him but just with a bunch of other players, we don't necessarily always know what they're working out. Um, also this weekend we saw – Jorbert Vivas and Eddie's Leonard, the most random players the Dodgers have on the 40-man roster because they tried to protect them last year and they didn't end up having the Rule 5 draft. But So good to see that uh, they're getting some shine in the Dodgers in, in the later innings of a first spring training game. Yep, yeah. You know, that's, if nothing else, we got to see them in spring training, even if we never see them in the big leagues. Yeah. Uh, but as we do go forward, you know, Jeff, and, and we can kind of share – us as fans and then us also as people that podcast, you know, when you do watch spring training games, what exactly are you kind of watching or looking for? It's, you know, I'm not really necessarily looking for anything specific. It's almost like when I'm watching a football game uh, and, and like I was watching the Super Bowl this year and my wife asked me who I was rooting for before the game. And I said, I don't know. I'm going to, I'll see when the game starts and I'll see who I find myself rooting for. Uh, obviously in a spring training game, I'm technically rooting for the Dodgers, but since I don't even care about the results, it's not even that big a deal there, but I find myself, it's like, well, let's see what I find myself being drawn to during the game. And so, you know, that's why Freddie Freeman's swing st stood out to me. It was like, I didn't know I needed to see that, you know, and uh, it's things. And maybe there's some confirmation bias, like with Jordan Yamamoto, because I, you know, like I said in our, I think that was our last episode that we eventually found. Jordan Yamamoto is not going to pitch for the Dodgers because he's not a good pitcher. And, and you know, so seeing him, not that not that I was happy that he got knocked around, but it was just like, okay, 
yeah, that's about what I expected. But, uh, you know, it depends on with different guys with Bruce star. I'm looking to see, can he get more swing and miss? I'll, it'll be the same thing with Dustin may. How's the swing and miss still taking that with grains of salt, but uh, really I'm just looking for little things with different guys to kind of show me, Oh, he's, he's starting to get ready for the big league for the, the regular season that actually matters. Yeah. And like I said, it, it, it's hard to kind of really watch and analyze based on the facts of all the caveats we've given of, Okay, you can be looking forward to watching a pitcher, but then if let's just say he's working on only throwing to you know the left side of the plate or only throwing to the right side of the plate, then we're throwing with one eye closed. Yeah, and we don't. Yeah, and we don't know that unless we somehow notice it. So then you know re- results based, we're looking at something that we're not necessarily looking for. But yeah, I mean, it's just nice to kind of see, especially early in spring, where all these guys are throwing one inning and you're seeing a bunch of different relievers. Just kind of see where they're at, anything new. Um, and then I do think, even though uh, Kristen Watson's going to be there all spring and she's asking guys questions as they come out of the games, those have been somewhat entertaining, at least. She's asking, you know, questions about the rule changes, but also just questions about the offseason. And, you know, Gavin Lux is funny. He's just, I, and I don't think he's not, he's not naturally funny. He's just funny because he's like kind of goofy in a sense. And then Chris Taylor's still boring, but it's just funny the way he answers questions. And that's kind of, you know, it, all in general spring, that's kind of what I'm looking at is, all right, how does this guy look? What does this look like? You know, this year we actually have things to look for in terms of kind of results based in terms of the outfielders and, you know, Hayward and Outman and Trace Thompson. But and then pitching wise, I don't think there's necessarily any real big battles other than nobody falls off from who should be on the, on the opening day roster from like already. Yeah. You mentioned the the interviews with Kirsten Watson. Uh, I would forgotten about that, but yeah, I generally, I, I'll watch the game with my volume down pretty low. Like I can hear it, but I'm not really listening, but I did find myself turning it up every time they were doing the interview because I, I did find those somewhat interesting, especially Freddie Freeman's. I, I thought he made a really interesting point about the, the pitch clock that I was going to mention in our first segment, but we were already going long. Uh, so I'll mention it now when we're going along for the whole episode uh, that, you know, Freeman talked about just batting after Mookie bets and Mookie puts on the sliding glove when he gets to first base and trying to figure out when does the, the 30 second clock start it, you know, do I have to worry about Mookie taking too long, putting on his glove in order for me to get in the box. So like, it, it didn't surprise me that Freddie Freeman is already thinking about that. Uh, but it, it was kind of cool. Like that just, I know one of those little insights that you don't really think about and then you realize, oh, wow, Freddie Freeman really, really thinks about this baseball stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Um, all right, Jeff, well, that's it. Dodgers got a full slate of games this week. Uh, they play the Padres today. If you're going to argue online with a Padre fan, just, I would recommend don't doing it, but, you know, up to you. Um, but, yeah, you got anything else to add, Jeff? Uh, no, I'll second that, though. Like. <laughs> Don't don't even think about fans from other teams. Be talk to other Dodger fans. Let's be friends. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's gonna do it for today's episode. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. Check out Locked On Fantasy Baseball for your second listen. Matt and Dom are bringing you the best fantasy draft strategies. You can find Locked On Fantasy Baseball wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. It's also how you can find us, and you can also find us on social media, Twitter and Instagram at Locked On Dodgers. Jeff is on Twitter at Snydog. I'm at Vince Samperio. DMs are open on all those accounts if you need to get a hold of us. You can also get a hold of us via email, LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com or via voicemail text at 323-863-5625. We're here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be with us. When you get in your car, if you're at home, tell your smart device to play podcast, Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. Have a good one. We'll talk to you tomorrow.